Let us remain standing just a moment now while we pray. Let's bow our heads. Our righteous Heavenly Father, as we are approaching Thee now in that all-sufficient name of the Lord Jesus, we want to give Thee praise for what Thou hast done for us, what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. In this last days of the closing scenes of this world's history, when time is fading into eternity, and we see the lights are shining. We know it's not long now until the coming of the Lord Jesus. We would ask the Heavenly Father to remember us tonight. And if there be any evil in us, take it out, Lord, tonight, that we might be presentable to Thee if You should come tonight. We pray for the sick and the needy. We pray for Thy church, both here and abroad, around the world, Thy children, everywhere of every nation, that we may wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. And listening for that call, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. May we be able at that time, Lord, by the grace of God and by the merits of Jesus, who we trust in, to trim our lamps and go forward then to meet the bridegroom. Take the word of the Lord tonight and circumcise our hearts. Take all unbelief out. Give us a great service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. May be seated. certainly nice to be back here in the, this sanctuary of the Lord tonight in the service. We had a most glorious time last evening up at the Brother um, Groomer. And I remember last year we had a glorious time. We've had a great time everywhere. The Lord has just blessed us exceedingly, abundantly, more than I ever thought He would do. But he's just so full of mercy and kindness. It's just good to know him, isn't it? And to think to know him is life. To know him is life. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to be down to uh, Central Avenue uh, Assembly, I believe it's called. Uh, brother Fuller. Another fine brother. And I think it's a big church down there. And we're hoping... Maybe we can have a, a prayer line, if it's all right, with Brother Fuller. So we, um, and then the, the next uh, morning, uh, we're to be at, the, um, I believe we call the Apostolic Church here in Phoenix. And I, I don't remember just who the pastor that brother was. Uh, was I there last year? No, that's a New Mexican church. And then... Sunday night at our precious brother uh, Outlaw's church up here, the Jesus Name Church. And I'm uh, with great anticipation and my family to get in there and hear some of that good singing. Billy Paul ought to know it every bit by heart. <laughs> we played that song, I'm going up, up, until honest, the thing is wore out on the tape. He'll start in the office, and every time of the day when I go there, no matter, he's playing that up, up, up. <laughs> we played it out, and the records is pretty near worn out. You know, I kind of had a feeling tonight that I'm a little hoarse. I thought, my, if I could just see somebody would speak for me. And I have to look over here and see Jack Moore. <laughs> just exactly right. <laughs> I never... <laughs> Oh, I believe that would just be wonderful, Brother <laughs> Jack. <laughs> now, nah, listen to that. <laughs> and I believe I see Brother Roy Borders sitting out here, too. Yes, sir. Brother Noel Jones sitting over here. Oh, my, we're just all around everywhere. <laughs> I think it'd be a good time maybe if I'd rest a little bit, you know, have some of these fine men to get up here and speak for me when I'm hoarse, you know. Um, 
Brother Jack said, the Lord's not in that revelation. <laughs> well, I was tired when I come, and, I, and I've been a little tired all along. And I see the people standing there, and I, how they have to stand, and I'm kind of glad I stand with them. Now, the Lord bless you. And we are looking forward now to these other meetings coming up. And then next week, it's uh, down to the uh, Pentecostal assemblies and on up. And we wind up next Wednesday night at Leventh and Garfield. I can't just remember them all in mind. At the, uh, I believe, the first assembly of God in the city. And, um, and then the convention starts at the Ramada. And now uh, there is a banquet uh, for the businessman uh, down at the, the main city of Arizona, Tucson. And, of course, we all know that Phoenix and these places are just outskirts of that city. And uh, that's right. That's the main place. That's my hometown, you know. So, and, um, so up on the hill, and then this is the, kind of the outskirts of it. Well, it's nice to have you all as neighbors. So. <laughs> I believe it was Brother Rasmussen one night said something like that in a meeting. And, oh, my, I tore the meeting up. I believe we was at, we was at uh, Houston. And uh, it was Ramsar, that's who it was. He said, the night the angel of the Lord came down, they took the picture. And he said, all you people around here from, uh, from Dallas said, we know that's the outskirts of Houston. And, oh, my. <laughs> Texas couldn't take it like you are. Some of you could. So there's a big hush over the meeting. Well, he is mighty good. And now, I think... We'll turn in the Scripture here and just give a little testimony for a while. Wouldn't that kind of change it? I've just beat it around so hard that I'm getting ashamed to look at you. <laughs> and uh, maybe give you a little bit of rest and give some testimony of the goodness of our Lord. Let's find a place in St. John, the 16th chapter of St. John. And um, I got a... 1612, I would like to read from, from that place in the Gospel of St. John. I like to read the Word because the Word is what makes us know that it's truth. Beginning with the 12th verse. And listen close now because I want to give testimony. And then we'll try to get in just a little early. I've been keeping you so late. And tomorrow night well, we'll stay uh, Half hour extra. That'll make it about one o'clock. <laughs> so so um, this is beginning with the twelfth verse. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, well, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall not glory by me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. You know, last evening especially, we had a little sample of that. Now, we being a full gospel people, believing in all of the operations of the Holy Spirit. And now that's the only way we can be full gospel, is to believe the full gospel. All the Lord has written. And I believe that we are ourselves are nothing. We are just like, uh, as I said to Brother Carl yesterday, looking at a tree. I said, isn't that a beautiful palm tree? But after all, there's nothing to it but a bunch of volcanic ash. That's all it is. And I said, how different it is now from that eucalyptus tree. Well, what's a eucalyptus tree? Volcanic ash with just a life in it. 
And I said, after all, what am I? What are you? Volcanic ash. I said, exactly, from the earth. Dust of the earth. With a life in it. But each life has been planted by the master life giver. And he knows just how and what to do and everything that he has placed here on earth is for his glory. The stars are for his glory. The winds are for his glory. The flowers are for his glory. And we are the crowning of his glory. But it seems like that everything will obey him but man. Man just seems to... He has such a time because that he was the only thing that fell. Everything else stayed in its original condition. But man fell. Therefore, God has a battle with him to get him to do what is right and to obey him. And one of the great problems for God down through the years, as the history of the church goes, is to find somebody that he can completely get in his control. He only needs one man. He's always used one man at a time. We studied that last few nights. One man, not a group. He just wants one. That's all he needs. Because two men would have two different ideas. He just makes one man. Represents himself through that one person. Never did he do it otherwise than that. Now he's got one person today. And that person is the one we just read after. The Holy Spirit. He is the person that God has sent forth the Spirit of Jesus Christ into the earth, the Spirit of God, to manifest and declare Christ through His church. See? Just to continue the life of Christ through the church. Now, it's such a marvelous thing, and, and yet it's so simple. If we would just stop and think, we press, we quiver, we, we fear, we getting flusterations and doubts, just thinking, well... Must I press in? It isn't that. It's just yielding. See? Realizing that you're nothing. And just let Him completely take you over. Take over your thinking. Take over... Now, I don't mean to walk up to Christ with, with just a, a blank mind. I don't mean that. You come to Him in your right mind. And in a, a, a penitent a mind. And a humble and then say, Lord Jesus, here am I. Now, it's written here in your word that you had many things yet to say to the disciples. You said they could not bear them now. And perhaps that's our case today. We cannot understand them. God can raise up just a little something different and altogether we denounce it. Instead of searching the scripture to see if it's right or not, we just quickly throw it away. There's nothing to it. We ought to search out these things. Find out whether they're right or not. And remember, if they're not right, they'll finally die. For Jesus said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. But I think it was Gramalia that made that great statement that time. If it be of God, we don't want to be found fighting against it. And, uh, and if it's not of God, it'll come to naught anyhow. So study it. And think of it. And now, he said in here, but when he, the Holy Ghost, has come. Now, someone said, some time ago it's been, speaking, said the Holy Ghost is actually your mental mind. You think. That would put the Holy Spirit a thought. But the Bible said when he, and he is a personal pronoun, see, see when he the person, Holy Ghost, God, comes, He will reveal these things to you that I've told you. Then you see there's no other way of knowing what is truth only by... You cannot get it by culture, by seminary experiences. You'll only get it by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's been sent to reveal it. Now... Then he also said, and he will show you things to come. Now, Hebrews, the first chapter, 
said, God in sundry times and diverse manners spake to the fathers through the prophets. But in this last day by His Son, Christ Jesus. See? It's the Holy Spirit taking over possession or taking possession of the church to operate Christ in the church. Then you become as He was. He become as you was so you could become as He was. See? He become you that you might become Him. That it's, it's above understanding. There's no way to explain it. And don't try it. Just accept it. He spoke it and that settles it. Just say it's right. Believe it. Now, as a young Christian, I've always made this statement. I was glad God got a hold of me before the church did. <laughs> Hard to tell what I'd have been. But I, I was thankful of the leadership and the direct contact that the Holy Spirit impressed my life with before I ever surrendered it. For as a little lad, I knew there was something. He had talked and I talked to him. He talked back to me. And I began to notice that the things that he told me as a little lad, that they began to happen in just exactly the way he said they'd do. So I know it had to be truth. Now I'm an old man now. And I, I have never one time and can call the world to, to stand still and ask them, put your finger on one thing that he ever told me and thus saith the Lord in the name of the Lord, but what was absolutely the truth and fact and come to pass. Out of the thousands times thousands of things. What, does, what am I saying that for? See, I've put us all as volcanic dust. But it's the promise of God's Word. Therefore, I cannot have confidence in myself. You cannot have confidence in yourself. But together we can have confidence in what's taken over ourselves. The Holy Spirit has taken us over. We must have confidence in that. And as we place our confidence in that, then the results come. It would be uh, out of reason for me to try to uh, even scratch the surface of telling you some of the things that the Holy Spirit has done in my own broken up uh, life. My days. I say this with His Bible open. His Word. And that's what He is. He is the Word. See, this, this seed here comes into the volcanic ash in a way of a spiritual being. God comes in as Spirit and operates through the ash. So it's not man. It's God. And if I should sit down and take time to write out the things that I have seen him do, it would make a volume of books. And to think of it, here are 53 years old and can say before God, his church, and the Bible in the presence of this group that I have not one time ever seen it fail. Perfectly on the mark every time. Exception of the other day when I come westward. You've played the tape, many of you, I guess, and you understand. I don't know what I'm waiting. I'm here now. I don't know why. I'm just waiting. It may be my going home time. It looks very much that way. If it is, there will rise somebody after me that will take the message on. You'd be an odd person, but he'll rise after this and take the message on. And you listen to it. As long as it's Scripture, stay with it. If it isn't, there's coming another potion. Now, for I do believe that we're living in the last days. And I am thankful that I have lived in this day. 
I wouldn't trade this day for no day. This is the most glorious day that's ever been on the earth. There's no other day that's ever taken this day. Oh, what would Moses, Elijah, Paul, Silas, those great heroes of faith in the days gone by could rise up and pick up a history book and look at exactly what they had prophesied about and come to pass and see where we're at now. While well, they'd have them in jail an hour. <clears throat> Certainly. They'd be like wild men up and down the streets just as hard as they could go a blasting the gospel. The time is at hand. Then we see tonight that we fall very short of the glory of God. But I would like to rehearse just an instant to kind of get to the church. By the way, did Billy Paul give out prayer cards in this church tonight? I just come from Tucson a few minutes ago. He, he gave out cards. Now, that's going to be an awful way of trying to bring them by. <laughs> we'll try it. Now, I won't take too long <clears throat> just giving testimony upon this Scripture that Christ keeps all His words. He has to. He has to do it. See, I don't have to do it. I'm a mortal, subject to mistakes. He's immortal, infallible. He has to keep His. But I don't have to keep mine, you don't have to keep yours. But He does. Oh, doesn't that place something in you? To know that He's, he's absolutely bound to that Word. And at this week, how we have come through the Bible with those prophets and patriarchs, and each time show that when the church got away from that, God sent someone right down and shook them right back to that Word again, lining up the church. It's always been. That's God's policy. He chose man to do so. Now, if He had chose the stars to preach the gospel, it had been done a long time ago. <laughs> they never got out of His will. If He chose uh, the sun to preach it or the... The winds to preach it that never got out of his will. See, but we're on the basis of free moral agency. We can act the way we want to. And that's the reason it's, we've been such a, a heartache to him. Always this way and wanting to inject our own ways and get away from his ways. <laughs> See? And as I have said before, man is constantly praising God for what he has done. And he's always saying what he will do. And then at the same time, ignoring what he's doing. Amen. Man will say, oh, God opened up the Red Sea. Yes, glory to God, that's right. Yes, Jesus is coming again. Hallelujah, that's right. But talk about him today. Oh, that was for another day, you see? see. Always what he has done, what he will do, and ignore what he's doing. That's the same conditions that Jesus Christ found when he came to the earth. Amen. Exactly. God had promised what he had did and here he was standing before him and they didn't know him. He's in the world. The world's made by him and the world knew him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. That's the glorious part. It was some time ago, a little vision I would like to speak to you about. And I don't know, I maybe never said it, but just to an individual somewhere. But I, I just lost one of the greatest persons on this earth to me, my mother. And I, I love my mother. How did I see her get away from the table when we were so poor, had nothing to eat? And she had, Papa would bring in some bread where he'd sweep out a store or something and pour the coffee over it and then put sugar on top of that. And mother would act like she wasn't hungry so that us kids could have something to eat. Oh, I, I can never forget that. And the many times that she picked me up and the things she did for me. But you know, God is, is just so full of mercy. He understands all those things when He has to take them. And I, I love Him for it. It's always been... That before any of my people die, I see it before it happens. In the vision, I see my brother. And I was only about 
18, 19 years old. I seen him before he left. I wasn't even a Christian. But I saw the vision come before me, see my brother go. I see my father when he went. I, Howard, many of you remember Howard. Howard, you remember me? Two years before it happened, I said, Howard, I seen your place marked. You're next. I said, get right, brother, because you're going to go next. And he did, just exactly. And then here some time ago, now, I hope this don't sound sacrilegious, but just to show the, the concern of God. God's always concerned in little things the same as big things. Now, I want to say this for the benefit of some of these fine preachers. That maybe, and I throw myself in it. Now, we'd everyone like to be a Billy Graham, but we'd, and we'd everyone like to be an Oral Roberts. But we, we are not a Billy Graham or an Oral Roberts. We are God's servant in the field that He has placed us in. And no matter how little it is or how great, it's just the same in the sight of God. Always the same. To act right in the place where you're at. Always, it's a great thing to follow the Lord. I would rather win or go and have a church with 50 people in it in the will of God than to go have 5,000 out of the will of God. Sure. God can do more with a man in his will in one hour than he could with a man out of his will in 50 years. See? He's stumbling and staggering like shooting in the dark. But when a man is really in the will of God and knows his calling, he yeah, well, should abide there. And now, visions, how the Lord God works with them. Uh, when he, the Holy Ghost, has come, he will reveal these things that I've talked to you about. Now, there's no need of trying to figure it out any other way. He is the author. He surely ought to know what he wrote. Amen. The Bible said he wrote it. Amen. Even man of old, moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the Word. And if the Holy Ghost is the author of the Word, surely he knows how to interpret it better than we do. Amen. Let him do the interpreting of it. And the way, you know how the way he interprets it, now, don't miss these things if you're coming to a healing service. Look. Don't miss this. How does he interpret it? By this, by vindicating it. See? Making it so. That's what Jesus said. Search the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life, and they are the ones that says who I am. They're the ones that speak of me. And who can condemn me? Who can accuse me of sin? Sin's unbelief. If I don't do the works that was written of me, then don't believe me. But if I do the works and you can't believe me, then believe the works because the, the Word spoke of it. See, that's just common, everyday sense. Now, God, gifts and callings are without repentance. We know the Bible says that. They do it. It's been about almost two years now. I was one morning... I was walking in the, the house and I sat down in a chair. Now, uh, this seems very strange that God would include an animal. Like some precious brother on that vision of heaven and that little carrying up I had. I believe I told you about it once or some meeting. He wrote me a letter the other day and said, businessman's voice packed and said, it was, your vision was all right, Brother Branham. Your translation, but listen. It was all right till you said your horse that you once rode. Come put his head on your shoulder. He said, there's no horses in heaven, Brother Branham. Heaven was made for human beings, not horses. Well, I thought, well, usually you see anyone like that. You have to explain everything. They're just trying to pick something. <laughs> you can't explain God anyhow. You've got the excuse to believe Him. But it might comfort Him. <laughs> I said, Brother, I never said I was in heaven. In the vision, I asked for Jesus, and they said, He's still beyond here. I was in a state like paradise. But that it might help you, the Bible said in the book of Revelations that Jesus came from the heavens of heavens, riding on a white horse, and all the host of heavens was following Him upon white horses. So there must be some up there <laughs> in the heavens of heaven. 
God's interested in everything. He's interested in the little things you do or the big things you do. He's interested in how you take care of your little flock or you other fellow take care of your big flock. He's interested. Some time ago, a famous fine brother of mine, we were down at uh, a fishing at a place. I was on, coming off the meetings and resting. We'd been fishing with snails. And we caught a nice mess of fish. And that night we was running our trout lines and we ran out of bait. Late in the afternoon, I went out to catch some little bluegills, little bitty fellows. Can't, the big ones, you can eat them, but this is just small bait fish. Now, I flipped the line in, the fly line is catching them, putting them in a bucket, and something struck me setting up on this boat. This boy had been a Jehovah Witness, and his brother had just got saved and um, filled with the Holy Ghost. And so the two boys was with us, and as I was catching these fish, all of us, something struck me, and I said, you know, there is going to be a resurrection of some life like a little animal. Well, a little animal. Now, many of you remember of the foregoing of the word that said there'd be a little boy who would come back from the dead had been struck by an automobile. Brother Jack Moore is with me tonight who was over in Finland when that happened. See, Many of you here remember me telling you through here. See? Told you to write it in your book. Notice. And Brother Woods turned around, Brother Banks Woods, the one this boy was healed with polio, and he turned and said to his brother, you just watch, something's fixing to happen. I kept on catching the fish. You see. So we baited up our lines with the fish. That night we caught nothing. The next morning I said, there were some, quite a few bluegill over there. And he said, say, by the way, didn't you say there's going to be some kind of resurrection of life? I said, yes, I tell you, when I left home, uh, there was my little girl. Uh, we're kind of, you people can have them if you want them now, see. But I'm scared of a cat. And so I, I just don't like that superstitious feeling you get around them. And um, so uh, we don't have them around the house. And, and uh, I believe the cat can realize that I'm afraid of him. So my father was afraid of cats. So then, my little girl's know not to have any cats around there. And a little, my little girl walked down the lane with another little girl. And she come back all sad looking in her face. And she said, Daddy. I said, what do you want, honey? She said, a horrible thing's been done. I said, what is it? She said, if you just only knew. I said, well, tell me. She said, somebody has thrown out a poor old cat down the lane here. And said, the thing's about ready to die can hardly walk. And said, Daddy, do you mind if we feed it and take care of it? I said, certainly not. If you want to feed it, just be careful. Don't let it scratch it. I said, let me see the cat. So when they brought the cat around, I got a box. And, of course, the next morning we had a whole bunch of kittens. And then, so the little, the little a boy of mine, when I was leaving little Joseph, he was looking at him. Oh, he thought they were cute, you know, climbing around, you know, and... And so he gets one in his hand, he squeezes it a little too tight, and he drops it on the concrete, and the little fellow began to turn around and around. I thought, oh my. And I thought, well, now that may be that little old kitten when I go back home. You remember the possum case. I thought, well, it might be that kitten. So then we were sitting back in a little cove fishing, and uh, we was catching these pretty good-sized bluegill then, throwing the small ones back. Brother Lyle, Brother Banks' brother, was fishing with a reeling pole, Great big hook and a big bunch of worms on. He let that little old blue gill swallow that hook plumb down his little belly. And when he pulled him up, he said, I wish you'd look at there, just about that long. And he just, he couldn't take the hook out, I guess, no other way. He just cut the string off. And he wanted to save his hook. So he just pulled gill's belly and all out of him like that and threw him over on the water. And he, he quivered three or four times and just laid there. He said, you shot your last water, little fella. I said, Lyle. When he starts to bite, get a smaller hook in that. When he starts to bite, take this flower rod laying here. And just as he starts to bite, catch him, see? Before he gets, then he swallows it, catch it in his mouth. Uh, that's the sport to catch him. Oh, he said, I'd make the wrong pool. And he just went ahead. And he tried a few times, missed about three or four. And he laid the thing down and said, I'll just let him swallow it again. So this little fish floated around on the water there for a little, oh, I guess, 30 minutes. And the waves began to get up and come in. 
I said, well, we'll have to leave pretty soon. We got a bucket now, so we'll have to leave. And I raised up to throw it back over on some lily pads to jerk it off. There's some of the big red belly back there. So I started to pull the, the, the bait off of the pad, throw it, flip it over on the pad and jerk it off, as you fellows and women know about fishing. And when I started to do that, all of a sudden something came down through them hills, just like a wind pouring. And it went up on me. I dropped the pole and stood up in the boat. And I looked around. I heard a voice say, You see that little fish? And there he was laying there. I said, You see the little fish? Just as he said it. There it, his little fins are stiffened out. And he was laid on the water for a half hour. And this Bible is laying open now. And he said, Speak to him and give him back his life. And I said, Little fishy. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I give you back your life. And those men standing watching that little fish turned over on his back and down through the water he went. They like to fainted. Lyle washed his face in water. He said, I'll wake up after a while. He said, I, I know I'm dreaming. I said, you're not dreaming. And right on the same time, I guess I had on prayer list 30 or 40 spastic children. And how God would go around from them spastic children and bring up that little fish. It just goes to show that He's interested in everything. Why would He use His power to curse a fig tree when there were thousands of lepers in the land? And He bypassed those lepers and went over and put a curse on the fig tree and said, No man eat from you. And the fig tree withered used his power showing that he's interested in trees. He's interested in fish. He's interested in you. He's interested in me. And he's interested to see his word made manifest. And he's depending on us to do it. For we are his agents. Nothing in ourselves. It's him yielding ourselves and walking with him. I saw a vision that morning. I've seen a large animal laying on the side of a hill. Oh, it had a mammoth set of horns. I was on a hunting trip in this vision, long about 10 or 11 o'clock in the day. And I slipped over and shot the animal. And then on the road back, a mammoth big grizzly bear raised right up against me. And I shot him. And then I seen him take the horns and a little hand reaching at the horns put the tape on it and it measured 42 inches from the top of the beam to the top of the horn. 42 inches high. i never seen an animal like it. Great big spikes on his horn. And yet it looked like a deer, but it's, oh my, make two or three deer. i never seen anything like it. Well, I said, probably it'll come to pass someday. I'll just write it down. I went out in Kentucky with a friend of mine, a brother of mine, Oregon, right? Called me and said, Brother Branham, are you busy? I said, not so bad. I said, so I'm, uh, i got two weeks now. I'm on a little vacation. I said, run up to Canada, uh, to Alaska with me. We want to organize a businessman's chapter at Anchorage and also um, over at Fairbanks. I said, sounds all right. If I can get the time to do it. He said, well, Brother Branham, if you'll do it, I'll tell you what. We'll give you a nice grizzly bear hunt. I thought, oh, that sounds fine. I thought, oh, there's a vision. So that's it. A nice grizzly bear hunt. I said, that sounds good. I don't go for that. But while we're up there and some of the guys wants to take me out free, I'll be glad to go. So uh, uh, he said, well, they'll, they'll do it. We got it fixed up. I said, when I wait, let me pray over it. And I went up in the woods that day. And every time I prayed, further away I got all the time, completely away from it. Oh, that's strange. And the two days after that, I called Brother Argan right. I said, no. He said, Brother Branham, we just getting things arranged. I said, don't do it. The Holy Spirit is condemned it. And I told him the vision. I said, I, I don't know, Brother Argan, right? But it's strange, but he won't let me go up there. And yet, it sounds like that, I, that would be the place. And he said, well, now, we're all set to go. And I said, uh, now, many of you will see Brother Argan, right? He's coming here now. If you make ready with me to go overseas after this meeting. And um, so uh, you can ask him the story. So he said, I said, no. I just can't do it. The Holy Spirit tells me not to. It's best to obey. No matter how much, how good it looks. 
I'm going to preach on something like that tomorrow night, the Lord willing. So now, remember, no matter how good it looks, if God isn't in it, stay away from it. No matter how glamour it looks, stay away from it. How prosperous, stay away from it if God isn't in it. Stay away from it. Now, we're going to speak on that tomorrow night, Lord willing. Now, then, when I went home, Billy said to me, my son, he said, Dad, do you know that hunter that you went hunting with last spring up there by the name of Southwick? Oh, I said, up on uh, in the, below the Yukon there? He said, yes. He said, he's got a letter here for, for you. He's uh, Brother Eddie Biscoll, which is the head of the uh, Ministerial Association of that northwestern country up in there. A very fine boy. May be here in this meeting. He's planning on coming this way uh, this time. Fine little boy. And he's um, got a nice family. He's, he's missionary up there now to the Crees, Cree Indians. And I was just with him last fall. And then, or last summer rather. Then he, Eddie wanted to take me over to Bud's, which was one of his converts to Christ. His wife was a staunch Pentecostal. Bud was a rancher. And he just recently come in, but he had been lauded where they drove the Indians out and put them on the reservation, a great territory for hunting, about six, oh, I guess he got uh, about 300 square miles or more around in there for a territory, lauded to him by the Canadian government. Well, that spring, when I was up there, we went bear hunting after the meeting, but when we, in May, but the Chinook come and it cut us off. We had about... You never heard of anything about the meetings, and Eddie kept pouring into him about the meetings. And he said, You don't mean to tell me that today that God is showing himself and show things is coming before it happens? Eddie said, That's exactly right. So he kept talking to me. He said, You know, I got a brother who's got epilepsy. He said, If you could just only get to that brother, he said, I believe if I could ever get him one of your meetings, I believe he'd be healed. I said, said, He's had all of his life. And I said, Perhaps so. Well, it don't get dark up there at that time of year. You know, the sun just goes down and gets... Boy, you can... Anytime midnight, one o'clock, you can just stand and read newspaper or anything, you see. And about, a, about the last part of May, the sun never goes down. It just barely tips about... Gone about ten minutes and comes back. So, when you, we just lay down whenever we got tired. And then on the road coming out, we met the bunch of Indians. And, oh, I got the old chief back there. They let him stay there because he's had two children. They bury their children in a log, their loved ones some kind of religion, and they hung them in the trees, so they just let that family stay there. Nice old fellow, past 90 years old, setting up in his saddle just as good as one of his boys. And um, so we left the next day. He said, there's no need to cross now. Go up over the mountains and this way. Oh, there's another 100 miles to cut a trail. So we couldn't do that. It's too late. We started back. And on the road back, Bud's got a string of young horses, and some of them got out in Muskegon and things, and I was going along there talking, and Eddie and I, and Bud was on the lead horse trying to get out. We had 21 head. And uh, I'd got a rope on one, got him out, and just as soon as he got out, then my own saddle horse got in. And here I was getting out over there, and I was muddy. And, uh, in a few minutes, I got up on my horse and wiped the mud off my clothes like that, started off, and right before me across that hill there, come a young man. I looked at him. I moved back the saddle and stopped my horse, and I seen him fall in a fit, going over and over and frothing. He got real arrogant and just tearing up everything. And then he quietened down. I seen an old salamander. I seen his shirt burning. Eddie was about half a city block ahead of me, trying to get another horse, a young horse, running off the trail, getting over in there, the, pulling the packs off of him, bucking them off. So then I run up there to Eddie. We got the horse quiet. I said, Eddie, I got the saith the Lord for Bud. He said, Brother Brandon, what happened? I said, a vision. I seen his brother. He said, oh, get him. I said, hold the horses back. I'll spur mine and get ahead and run around these horses, see if I can get them, hold them against the side of the hill. And I run around the cliff like this with my, my horse, uh, push him up, and got up there, and I put my hand over on the saddle. I said, Bud? He said, yes, Brother Branham. I said, I want to tell you something. Your brother, and described him. He said, yes. Who told you? I said, nobody. The Lord just showed him to me. I said, will you believe me as his servant? He said, certainly, Brother Branham. I said, send down about, about 800 miles back to civilization. Get your brother to come up here. And the first time he falls in one of those fits, I said, he's had these since about two years old. 
You might not believe it, but it's hereditary. Your grandfather had them. He said, oh, that's the truth. That's right. Now, I said, now, when this boy has this fit, you jerk the shirt off of his back and throw it into the fire and say, this I do in the name of Jesus Christ, according to his word. And he'll never have another one. As long as he'll believe it. He just raised up his hands, started screaming. He said, I've never seen it done, but you sure told me just what my brother looked like and told me the truth about my grandfather. I said, that's right. After we left, he sent and got his brother, and he was going out to cut trail that morning when he come up on uh, the bus, coming up past this two or three times a week up down the Alaskan Highway. He come over, to, and Bud's wife, Lila, is just a little bitty thing, a little woman about as big as a bar of soap after her family's washing is done from it. Just a little, got five children, and a sweet little woman, and so... Uh, Bud went out to fix his horses because he's going to cut trail so we could get back in that uh, 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 with his hunters. And as soon as he was gone, while well, his brother in there, without taking his good clothes off yet, he fell in a fit. And they were camping in an old barracks where the Americans, when he's building the highway, had it there. And when they had a big old salamander as a stove, and little Lila, he got, uh, he got rational when he got them spells. And she was scared to death of him. And she'd clear a window or something or get out of the way. But she started to jump out. And she thought of what had been said. She'd been in one of the meetings down at Dawson Creek. She rushes over there and straddles this big fella. Jerks that shirt off his back crying. Buttons and all. His white shirt. Walked over to the stove and said... This I do in the name of the Lord Jesus, according to the word of the Lord that was told to us. And he's never had one since. Mm-hmm. That settled it. He had sent for me to come a free hunt. And I'm always looking for them free things, you know. So I thought, well, I said, I'll go. I'll see if the Lord lets me go. I prayed and just no more in praying. Everything moving right that way. I took Brother Fred Southman. He's here somewhere in the big meeting. Where are you, Fred? Uh, there it is. He's one of the trustees of our church. Brother Fred knows that this was told three months before it happened. Is that right, Brother Fred? And I guess, Brother Simpson, how many is in the building tonight that knows that before it happened was told? Raise up your hands. There you are. And it was told before the church exactly what would happen. Well, I didn't know this would be the time. So I went up to the, uh, the Alaskan Highway, and Brother Fred stopped off uh, at a friend's to go moose hunting. It's too far up back there for moose. So we're up in sheep country where we was going. And so we, uh, I took a, a piece of a chalk or dirt and drawed on the windshield. I said, now, Brother Fred, so if this is the time, you'll remember exactly what it will be. And he remembers it. I went on up. That night when we got to the camp, Bud said, Brother Branham, he hugged me, jumped up and down, speaking in tongues and hollering, you know. He said, and that an old rough cowboy, too. And he, he uh, just praising God. He said, you know what, Brother Branham? My brother has had a fit from that time on. He's perfectly normal and well. Amen. Year before. And I said, as long as he will believe it, it'll continue that way. And uh, I said, now tell him to... Surrender his life to Christ and serve him the rest of his days. Go and sin no more, or worse thing come upon him. See? I said, tell him to do that now. So I said, I have another vision. And I told him of the vision. I said, now, there were some little fellows with me. We was on a hunting trip, and they were small men. And one of them had a green plaid shirt on. And um, he said, um, well, he said, Brother Branham, he said, I don't have a green plaid shirt. His boy, Blaine, 18, said, he doesn't have a green plaid shirt. Eddie Biscoe, another little bitty fellow, weighed about 110 pounds. He said, uh, I don't have one either, Brother Branham. I said, well. I said, now the animal, he said, what kind of an animal was it? I said, it looked like a deer. He said, there's no deer up here. This is too high. <clears throat> he said, maybe it was a caribou. I said, a caribou has a panel. He said, that's right. I said, this had spikes. He said, well, Brother Branham said, we're going to sheep country, not deer country or anything like that. I said, well, it's probably another trip. Brother Oregon, right? It might have been Alaska somewhere. I said, because there's a mammoth big grizzly. He said, what kind of a grizzly was it? I said, silver tip. That's the most famous of all of them. He said, I'm a guide. I've been in these woods here all my life. I've never seen a silver tip. 
said, I've seen a regular old grizzly, but said, uh, I've never seen a silver tip, never seen one in my life. I said, well, there's some, one somewhere, and I'm going to get him. He said, I'll say that's the truth. <laughs> he said, I'll say that. We took off. Three days later, we made camp plumb up above Timberline, and God help me. If they stay that way to the millennium, let me live there during the millennium. I just love to bathe in that nature there. Oh, anybody couldn't see God there as, as blind, deaf, and dumb. Just to see him reflecting himself in those great mammoth mountains. Oh, my. The deep call to the deep man. And up there just having a glorious time. So we went up on the one mountain. You just have to walk straight like that. Let's get up it. All, no timber, just simply caribou moss is all you see. We seen about 30 or 40 head of sheep. There wasn't none big enough to take. Just little half rounds and three-quarter rounds. And I, I wanted one big enough to come out of there with. So by going that far back. So we, uh, I went back down. And the next day we started across and Eddie fell in the water. When he started to jump across with a big pair of shoes on. Going up the side of the mountain, Bud stopped and said, Let me have your glasses, Billy. I give him glass. We'd walk a piece and talk about the Lord and shout and run up and down the side of the hill. Just have a glorious time. It's good to go on a hunting trip if you go with brothers. Amen. And so uh, he took my glasses. He said, Brother Branham, there's your old ram. There's about eight of them laying about six miles right there on top of that other peak. Look at them. See them together? I picked up. I said, I'll say there they are. Exactly. He said, well, we might as well go back down and start in the morning about three o'clock. and said, we ought to be up there by nine o'clock, ten. The old rams will be laid down. That'll just be the time. I said, what's some other things walking around there? I said, that's caribou. I said, so six miles away, you know, it's hard to tell what they look like. And then from then on, 600 miles away, the crow flies. There's not even a path or a trail. And when you hit the West Coast, you go about 800 miles to Vancouver. There's not even a speck of civilization. And the next civilization is going this way is Anchorage, about seven or 800 miles. Go back this way, you run into the little city at Yellowknife where you get a ship in there once a year for the Eskimos. And next you hit Russia. So you're really to yourself. That's where God can take His rest up there from all of our troubles and trials that we put Him into. So I like to go up there and talk to Him when He's resting. Is he? So then, went like it was last night on the, the ship. So when we went back down, and the next morning we started early. Along about 8 o'clock, we'd wound through, shin tangling everything until we got to the top of the hill. And on the road up here went an old cow caribou and a nice-sized bull. He went and started up the hill, and big panels on him, and I said... Well, and so there is the first caribou i ever seen in the woods wild. I've never been this high before. He said, yeah, that's a caribou. So we went on up the hill and looked. The sheep wasn't there. So Bud and I walked around and Eddie started slipping around and Blaine, his boy, looking around for a game. And we walked over here and, oh, my, I just screamed out, glory to God. I looked down there and there was on big snow peak mountains, yellow caribou moss below the snow. And just below that come in the evergreen, which was the pygmy spruce. And got a little farther down, there was the buck brush, red. A little farther that was the quaking ass, yellow, all reflecting in the lake down below. And oh my. Bud and I just put our arms around one another and just danced a little jig around there, just screaming and shouting and praising God. And we sat down with our arms around one another and just praised God and had a wonderful time. I guess about two hours. And uh, I said, say, when do I become of Eddie? We called him the dude. So we went back and started across the hill. I said, he couldn't get lost up here. I said, no, Blaine's back over there somewhere. And he's an Indian. <laughs> so we looked around and I seen a movie camera laying there. I said, that was Eddie's. And looked back down the hill and I went over this way and he went the other way. And Eddie's going, shh, shh. He's stalking that little bull caribou. And he's going to take him back down, feed him to the Indian friends that he was missionary to. So he shot the caribou. We went out and cleaned it out. Come back so long, about 1 o'clock. We found our saddle horses again, about a half mile away where they're standing. And we were standing there. He said, Brother Branham, you like to walk? I said, I sure do. He said, if we scale this mountain, them rams went across this way and went down to that other hole over there, maybe. If they didn't, it went back this other way. So let's let Eddie and them go back and go through this cut down here and take my saddle horse and your saddle horse and pack the caribou to the camp and... We'll walk this up through here and hit that place, and we ought to get in by 10 or 11 o'clock tonight. I said, fine, we'll do it. So we stand there, we just eat a can of sardines apiece, each one of us, and we buried under the moss of sardines. And our bread, we had our shirt and sweated until it was all in one big lump, but it was good when you're hungry. <laughs> it's all right. So we stood there, and I was just looking around, 
And I looked through the glasses and I said, Bud, looky here. What is that over there? About three mile away, there laid that caribou. And it was an odd one. It wasn't panels, it was big spikes. I said, you remember? Looky here. There's that panoramic, just exactly. And there lays that animal just the way. And I said, there's only one thing that hinders the vision. Somebody with a green check shirt. And there stood Eddie with a green sh- check shirt on. I said, I thought you didn't have one. He said, my wife must have put that in the pack. When I fell in the water yesterday, he had changed shirts. He said, I didn't know she had it in there, Brother Branham. I'm sorry I told you something wrong. I said, you just had to do that, son. <laughs> oh, but begin to shout. He said, you can stand right here and shoot him three miles away, can't you, Brother Branham? I said, according to the vision, I was right on him. He said, Brother Branham, I- I'll tell you how you going to get over there. I said, I don't know, but I'm going to get over there. So... He said, well, how are you going? I said, going around this panoramic. He said, that's shale. And I said, said, if you slide, you'd have about thousands of tons of snow on you in about a second. And I said, the Lord will take care of that. That's the way I went in the vision. Right on right. He said, well, I'm going to follow you. <laughs> here he comes. And these boys said, we'll stay here now until we see you get the caribou. And I said, then we'll, we'll go on down, take the horses and go on in. We'll meet you down at the end of the draw, about, oh, about four or five miles down. And he said, all right. So we started around Bud and I, in about a half hour, we worked right around, and that caribou laying right there looking right at us, never seen us, he must have been asleep, and went up over a little cut and come back, and come up within 30 yards of him. There he laid, this mammoth big animal, rose up from there, and I got him. And while we were sitting there, taking the cape and so forth from it like that, Bud said, did you say these horns is 42 inches? I said, that's exactly right. He said, Brother Bram, they must be 142. Great, big head. And I said, no, it's just exactly 42. He said, I got a tape measure down there. I said, do you doubt it? He said, no, sir. He said, but wait a minute. Didn't you tell me that you were going to get a big grizzly bear before you got back down? It'd be a silver tip before you got back where that boy was a green shirt on. I said, that's the truth. Look back down the hill. Well, there is a thing that high. Nothing at all. It's moss. All you see, miles and miles, just rolling hills and moss. He said, where's he at, Brother Branham? I said, he can provide one. <laughs> he said so. I said, do you doubt that, bud? He said, no, sir. Well, coming down the hill, to come like this. He had packed the rifle a while, and I'd packed the head, and then vice versa. He just had to walk sideways coming down. That big horn's just raking into the moss. And we got within about a mile of it. We stopped, looked around, and said, that old bear better be showing up, hadn't he? <clears throat> I said, what you, what you bothered about? I said, nothing. We went on to a little glacier coming across. We sat down there and got cooled off a little. He said, Brother Branham, just think of it. He said, we haven't got over about oh, less than a half a mile till we hit them boys, and somewhere between here and there, you're going to kill a silver tip. I said, that's right. <laughs> That's right. He said, I said, you're doubting that, bud. He raised up and took me by the hand. He said, Brother Branham, my brother has never had a fit from that day to this. He said, the God that could tell you my brother wouldn't lie to you. I said, bud, he'll be there. He said, where will he come from? I said, I don't know. But I said, bud, I'm 52 then. And I said, I saw vision since a child. And when I saw this caribou here killed, and you see if his horns isn't 42 inches. And then the same vision, uh, on my road back down to where that company was that I was with, I killed this silver tip bat grizzly. He said, well, Brother Bram, I can see for 20 miles. He said, God's going to have to pull him up out of the ground or bring him down out of the skies or something. I said, don't you worry. He'll be there. We went about... Another hundred yards, he is just about wore out to this, weighed about 150 pounds, this trophy. So coming down the hill, and you set it down, he said, Whew, I'm about to give out. I said, yep. We come into a little pygmy, pygmy spruce then about that high. And there's a few grouse flying around, and there's automaton hens, and so I throwed some rocks at him like that. So he said, uh, 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 did you ever hear them tomkins? And I said, no, I don't believe so. He said, they're fine, they're as good as grouse. He said, Brother Branham, talk over his big old black hat. Fanny himself said, about time that old bear show up, ain't it, boy? And I said, I said, Bud, you're doubting that. He said, no, I'm not. But, Brother Benham, I, I just can't understand. I said, neither can I. It's not for me to understand. It's for me to believe. Amen. Amen. 
God in heaven knows these things are true. Would I stand here and say this? It wasn't true. Then I started to turn around to give him the rifle and me pick up the head. And as I turned, I said, Bud, you got them glasses around your neck. Why does that stand up there on the side of the hill? And he threw the glasses up. He said, oh, help me. <laughs> said, if it ain't somebody's milk cow, <laughs> and it ain't no such a thing in the country. Said, that's the biggest grizzly I've ever seen in my life. And so help me. Look at that yellow sun shining on him. He's a silver tip. Said, how far you say he is? I said, about two miles up there. And we was about wore out. He said, I said, what are we waiting on? Let's go. And he said, you sure getting him? I said, sure I'm going to get him. <laughs> He said, what's that gun you're using there? I said, no, never mind about that. A little bitty gun. Some brother gave me in a meeting one time several years ago. And I said, a little cheap, 270. And I said, all right, I got, I, it's going to be, we kept going a little closer. And of course, we got bigger than that bear looks. He said, oh, he looks like a mammoth haystack sitting up there on that marsh. You know, great big mammoth thing head about that wide, you know. Joe sticking out. Great big paws. And he just, Poking up these little blueberry branches, I catch on eating them, and so that great big fellow. We got about all oh, about eight hundred yards of him. He said, "Hey, brother Branham, did did you ever shoot a grizzly before?" <laughs> I said, "I've shot many bear, bud, but I never did shoot a silver tip grizzly before." He said, "You know the silver tip is the biggest fighter of all of them." I said, "Yeah, I understood that." He said, "He don't know how to die," and I said, "Well." He said, Don't, uh, how, how, how far you have, how close you have to get to him with that? Uh, you just ask him, write him a letter. I'll give you that address. He said, let anybody write me about it. It won't steal any of them things. Let me tell him. And so, um, and uh, I said, uh, well, I said, uh, he said, um, now, I said, no, no, I was closer than this, but I was right up close to him. He said, we're getting pretty close now. He can charge at any time. I said, I know it, but I said, but I said, it'll be all right. He said, now, when you shoot a bear, he said, now, Brother Bram, you shoot him in the back. You have to break him down because he'll keep on fighting. He can't get up then. I said, no, according to the vision, I shot him in the heart. He said, I hope you didn't make no mistake on that. And I said, <laughs> I said, I didn't. I said, I remember that because in a, in a vision, you're in, you're in one conscious and both. As we explained it the other night. You're in two. You can't forget it. See? So there you are. So we got in again about... About 250 yards. As just the last little coolie we went over. And I said, that's just about it now. Look at him. Isn't he a beauty? He said, yeah, I guess he is. And I said, all right, bud. Now when I raise up from here, he's coming. And I said, you just watch. And he said, I'll be watching. <laughs> so I put a shell up in the barrel of the gun, you know. And it was down under this little coolie. And just as I raised up, here he come. <laughs> I stopped, shot. And this sounded like a pea shooter hit him. Well, I never a bit more checked him up and nothing. And my, before you talk about speed, i never seen anything like that. He did outrun a horse, deer, or anything. You know, a bear came like that. And him coming right down that hill, right towards us, like that. And I, before I could get another shell in a gun, he dropped dead about, uh, oh, about 30, 40 yards from me. Just turned end over end. Took heart, lungs, and all from him. As a nozzler bullet you hand loaders know. So it, it uh, Load him up. And he fell over. Bud standing there and looked over his real white around the mouth. He said, Brother Brandon, I didn't want him on my lap. And I said, neither did I. <laughs> he said, Whew. I said, I won't tell you after it's over, boy. If that hadn't been one of them visions and I'd seen it happen before, I'd never come up here with that close to that bear with you. <laughs> and neither one of us could budge him. He weighed around a thousand pounds, I guess. So, mammoth big fella. We couldn't clean him. We got skinny. We started on down, and we said, "Brother Branham, we picked up the horns." He said, "If them horns are exactly forty-two inches, said I'm just going to have a running fit." I said, "You better have it right now, then, because <laughs> that's what it is." He said, "I have never seen. I, 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 it seems to me like I'm dreaming this." And when we got down there, and I said to um, to Eddie, I said, "Now you watch." Blaine will put his hands. Now, you remember, there's a little hand around that horn. Remember, Brother Fred, how I told you it would be? And I said, you watch it to Eddie. And so Bud said, wait, he got his horse over there. And we had bear on us. You know, them horses just tearing up everything. You know how they do when they smell a grizzly or any kind of a bear. So I, I went over there help, trying to hold a horse, a uh, saddle horse trying to get away. And he went over and got his tape measure, come walking across there, looking at me like that. He said, come here, Blaine. I punched Eddie. Put it down on this. So help me. 42 inches on the nose. 
Now, them horns shrink about two inches when they dry up. That grizzly bear is laying in my den room. And the horns are hanging on the wall. The taxidermist had fixed them and fixed them up. There's a tape measure hanging on them. Forty-two inches exactly. Now, what would God tell a man something like that for about a hunting trip? When I got back, mother was sick. I went to see her. She said, Billy, see, he was encouraging me, getting me ready for something. And I said, Mama, the Lord's always healed you. She said, Billy, I'm going home to see Dad. Oh, I said, Mom, don't talk like that. She said, yes, I am. And I prayed for her, Brother Fred and all these witnesses sitting here and all. And then, next thing you know, they had her in a hospital. The doctor didn't even know what was wrong. Well, I went out to pray for her. She said, Son, I'm going. And I, my mother was kind of a powerful woman anyhow. One day, a couple days after that, I walked in. She's standing there looking right up towards the heavens. She said, Billy, I see you. I said, well, sure, Mama. He said, I see you right here. She said, oh, you're so old, Bill. said, your white hair and beard is hanging together. You got your arm around the cross reaching for me. I had a good idea then. That was it. Now, you brethren here know that to be the truth. The next day was Sunday. I was preaching. They sent me word. I said, I do not believe that Mother is going. God always shows me my people going. But Mother, he's never showed me nothing about it. Here come a message in. I was right in the middle of a message like this. Someone come in and said, go, go to your mother right now. Call her on the phone. She's dying at this minute. I said, death, hold her still. The Word of God is more important than that. This man sitting right here, Brother Borders. After the service is over... I went out to see my mother. I met Brother Borders. He said, Brother Branham, you're not quite six foot, but I've seen a ten-foot man standing in the pulpit this morning. I said, Brother Borders, God will take care of all that for Mama. And a few days after that, they called me out of the room, and she really was going. Gathered in the children, stood around the bed. I said, Mama, are you really going? She said, Yes. And she couldn't speak no more. I kept telling her, what does Jesus mean to you, Mother? I remember baptizing her in His name long ago out in the water. I said, tell me what He means to you now. She said, more than life to me. I said, Mama, if you're going, I'm your boy, a preacher. I want to know when my own mother is going to meet God. I want to hold your hand here, Mom. I want you to. I kept holding it. She couldn't talk. It looked like she was paralyzing her face. I said, can't you talk no more, Mama? She couldn't make... I said, listen, is Jesus still this the same to you? She could nod her head. Then she got to a place she couldn't nod her head no more. I said, Mother, is Jesus everything to you now? He's coming for you in a minute. Everything to you? She couldn't move. I said, Mama, you only got one thing. You see your bat in your eyes. If Jesus still means just the same to you as He always did the day I baptized you in the water, bat your eyes real fast. She bat her eyes, the tears running down like that. A little wind comes sweeping into the room. Mother went home. I come home. Went out to the funeral home, picked out the clothes. Oh, you know how it is. You've had to do the same thing. The kids all crying, one down in one place and one another. I said, Mama was a hitch post. We'll never be the same no more. Doc, his family in this corner, Jesse and his family in that corner. We just buried Howard recently. I said, well, we're gone, boys. I said, we'll, we won't come to see one another. Mama was our stay. I said, we won't see one another no much more now. I went up home, nighttime, after we got our clothes picked out. I went up home. Mrs. Domico, anybody know her from Chicago? Been a very dear friend of the campaign. She'd give me a Bible. Excuse me. And it was a, one of those red letter Bibles with a zipper on it. And somebody, when I preached that sermon, the lamb and dove, they'd sent me two doves as a holder. Another brother of mine, Brother Norman, had sent me a little dove and a lamb. A brother Borders gave me the lamb. I picked up the Bible. Meaty was over in one corner crying. 
And all you businessmen here know, when I was in Jamaica, see my mother-in-law, told you at the table out there in Jamaica, I said, someone of my people is dying and hasn't got any teeth. I see them going right at the table, Demas Shakarian and all of them sitting there. A few hours, man, my mother-in-law just almost dropped dead at one time, see? No teeth, just exactly. And I said, I see a young man spit blood. And I called and said, don't let Billy. Is anybody here was at the, the Jamaica meeting over there at that time? At, at Jamaica? King's, yeah, there, sir. So then, um, and I said, uh, it must, Billy, don't you go up there. I seen a young fellow spit blood. And it was my brother-in-law. He had a hemorrhage when his mother died. It just stood him in such a shock. Then standing here that day, I picked up this Bible. I said, Father, I don't know. Maybe just your love. You didn't show me her going. But I'm so broke up, God. Will you just give me some word of comfort out of your word? I said, let me just read something that's comfort, comforting to me. And I just let the Bible open up like that. And there it was. Big red letters. She is not dead, but sleepeth. And I went in the room. We went to sleep. About 8 o'clock next morning, got up. Just go to have her fixed up around about noon so we go down and see her. Meaty went out to get the children's breakfast. And little Joe crying. Becky in one corner still crying. Will I ever see Grandma again? I said, yes, yes, you'll see her. She just crossed, went upstairs. I said, she, we'll see her again. And she loved them little kitties, you know. And so, and they was all crying. Can we see Grandma this afternoon? I said, you can see the body she lived in, but Grandma's gone up to be with your other grandmother. And I'm up in heaven. And Joe couldn't understand it, my little boy. You know, he just couldn't understand it. He said, well, then will Grandma come back down tonight? And I said, no, no. I don't know when she'll come back. When Jesus comes, she'll come back. And I stand there. And I turned around, walk in the room. And when I did... Don't ask me to explain it. There's no way to explain it. I seen myself standing out there just the same as I looked across this audience. And I was leading songs. I never did that. I can't even sing at all. So, and there's a great mammoth crowd of people. On this side, the, the auditorium looked like it was uh, outside, um, like, uh, oh, I don't know what you would call it. Kind of down a hill and kind of like an amphitheater. And if so far back the lines was to the head to be raised up like this, so the ones so far in the back had to look this way. But all right in the middle, just three rows like this. And right in the middle was just like wind rows, ricked in of little spastic crippled children laying in them rows. And I had on a dark suit. And I was singing, Bring them in, bring them in, bring the little ones to Jesus we sang that church quite a bit, especially in dedication of children. And there was a like a, a box here where the celebrity sat. And the pulpit was close to that, but I was down leading songs. And all at once me standing there and looking at myself, then, oh, don't try to think it out because you can't. Then when I was here, then I become here. I don't know. Two of them went together. And it's, um, that's a good thing when the two go together. I got a camera up there. Coming down, I didn't know how to take a picture. I looked through the thing, and man, I could see five or six different objects. So I began to focus it. Billy told me, said, focus it. And they all come to one. <laughs> it's a good idea to do that, you know. You see things different when you go to focus and then use God's Word for a focus on Him, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> but get it in focus first, you see. So standing there, looking. And I went into that vision. And while in there, I noticed a renowned person come back at the back of the place. And they were, I said, well, they're coming to the celebrity box. So they come walking up this way. And I thought, well, I'll sing once more while that lady is coming. She's dressed old-fashioned. Now, some of you ladies will remember this. When they wore uh, uh, kind of skirts like around here, and it went way down over laced-up shoes. And they had a, a kind of a full... What does she call them things like uh, like this lady's got on here now? That uh, blouse, blouse. One of those things like that. And uh, had real full sleeves in it. You remember them? And one up around the neck here. The little, kind of a little button of a thing went in here. And then a great big hat on turned up on the side. And the ladies, them days they wore long hair. And so they pulled it down like this and set a hat on it and put a pin in it. You know, to keep it on for they had to ride side saddle and things. So this lady was coming up. And everybody was respecting this lady. 
And I thought, well, she'll go to the celebrity box. So then I was said, once more, all on this side, bring them in. Now over here, bring them in. Then all in the middle. All together now, bring the little ones to Jesus. Just as I said that, this lady had already entered the box. Now I could see when she entered the box, everybody stood up. And they were kind of doing like this, recognizing her. And she was recognizing them. I thought, well, it's time for me to preach. And I'll go praying for them sick people. And I got up here on a, on a pulpit like this. And the box was right as close as this brother sitting here. And um, I turned around like this. I thought, well, now that lady will bow to me. So I'll just recognize her. And so when I turned around, she already had her head down like this. And I just put my head down like that. And when I raised my head up, same time to meet her, it was Mama. Young. Pretty. I looked at her. I said, Mama. She said, Billy. And just then, lightning began to flash around in the building. Thunders roared and a shaking come. And a boy said, Do not fear about your mother. Said she's the same way she was in 1906. Amen. And the, I said, What? 1906? And Meaty said, What's the matter with you, my wife? I said, Honey. 1906. What was 1906? She said, why? I said, a vision. I seen Mama standing right here. I said, you seen what? I said, I seen Mama. I said, sure enough, Bill. I said, yes. She's standing right here. And she was pretty. And he said, I said, she's just a young woman. So I went and got the old family record. And you know what she was, 1906? My father's bride. That's the year she is married. Now, she's part of another bride. The bride of the Lord Jesus. Someone from somewhere sent me a nickel. I got it here in my pocket. 1906. And He, the Holy Ghost, when He has come, He will reveal these things to you that I've said and will show you things to come. Now, what is it? The hunting trip was only building me up, you see. One of the good, best trips I ever took, knowing that this great shock, that was love. And brother, sister, if all these other visions has been perfectly right of what the Holy Spirit has showed, it's got to be the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that if it come to pass, then it was Him. Then what a hope we got. Someday we're going to leave this place. We're going back to a young man and woman. Never to die no more. I'd rather know that than to know that I was going to be a president of the world and live for a million years. I'd rather know that I was in the hand of God. And I'm glad to know tonight that that same Jesus that made that statement, He sure after 2,000 years... See, it can't perish. It's eternal. And He's just same Jesus tonight that He was the day that He made this statement. And He'll still confirm that word if we'll believe it. Do you believe that? When He, the Holy Ghost, has come, He will not speak of Himself. But He will take the things that, of mine, that's the Word, and will show them to you. And then also, He will show you things that is to come. And the book of, of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the Bible said, the Word of God is sharper. Now, who was the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the sunder into the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts in the heart. That's our God. We're not lost, friends. We're still in grace of God. I, I feel to talk of anything and speak of a past tense and as I said last night as those disciples were trying to live 
on a, the meeting that they'd had the day before. Looking forward for another, but forgot the very creator of the wind and waves is laying in the boat. The God that was up there in those mountains. The place that silver-tipped grizzly, according to his word, it lays there on the floor for evidence. Now, if you wish to write that man, just write, Bud Southwick, S-O-U-T-H-W-I-C-K, Bud Southwick, Fort St. John, British Columbia. And just let him write the letter back to you. And hey, by the way, if you're taking a hunting trip, there's a good guy to go with. Now, notice, he has told that amongst all those hunters up and down that road to, I believe I'm going to have a real meeting the next time I go up there just with guides. Yeah. To see those things happen just the way they do. That was last year. This is this year right now. That same Jesus that made that promise said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. You believe that? Amen. With such evidences, with such truth, vindicated, positive truth, how can we feel any other way than like we just like to go through that roof? Be raptured. Have we let the things of the world dull us in such a way where we see such vital things that's positive proven to be the truth? Now, each sick person in here if you will only believe that same one that made that promise and by the same one that took that epilepsy off of that boy, that man, he's the same God that's right here now. If I could take it off of you, I would do it. But I can't do it. He's already purchased that for you. And the only thing you have to do is to believe it. What if the boy would have fell into fit and the little woman said, Now, what's that shirt got to do? That probably wouldn't work on no one else. See? Just on him, because it's sent to him. Naaman dipped in the river seven times, but somebody else dipping probably wouldn't get over their leprosy. See? But the notice, it's what he says is the truth. A vindicated, perfect truth. Now, it's getting late. The call even a prayer line. Let's, let's just stop that for a minute. Let's just think. Is that what God promised? That would be the genuine Holy Spirit that would do that. Is that right? Well, who would say that He wasn't the Holy Spirit? He was. I and my Father are one. The Holy Spirit was His Father. She shall bring forth that holy thing which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost in God is the self-same Spirit. And it was in Him. And watch what He did when a woman touched His garment. When He looked out upon the audience and perceived their thoughts. Don't the Word say that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts of the heart? Does not he promise in St. John twelve or Saint John fourteen twelve that he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also? Amen. Or has it ever failed but what is the truth? Then God is here. Amen. He's sure to make every person in here well. He's sure to save every lost soul. And before I make an altar call, it was I feel led to do. See? To make this altar call. Let's just call on him. How many of you will forfeit or say, if I can, maybe the strangers here, say, i never seen one of those meetings. I, I've heard people talk about these things, but I, I've really never seen it. It would encourage my heart if I could see the very presence of Christ come in among the people and do that same thing that He did. Would it encourage you? Let's bow our heads a word. Every eye closed. Now let the Spirit that follows the Word. Now, Father, I have the best that I know how. You know my heart. Knowing that these people are suffering under this heat 
and that they're crowded in, standing, but they've been very patient. I can imagine it was the same kind of a crowd that stood on the bank that day and heard you speaking from the boat. And then you told them, launch out into the deep and let down the net for the draw. Not see if there's some there. They were there. And how those notable words of that apostle said, Lord, we sained all night and took nothing, but nevertheless, at your word, we're going to let down the net. And when they obeyed your word, they closed a multitude of fishes even till their nets began to break. Lord Jesus, no doubt that many women left their washing that morning. Many men left their fields and the crops. Fishmen left their nets to hear the Word of God. Lord Jesus, if you were here in physical form tonight, it's very doubtful that any more than what is gathered would gather. But these people believe that you are not dead, that you are raised from the dead. And you manifest your word and keep your word. The word that I have read to them out of the Holy Scriptures tonight. And as our Lord one time was handed the Bible or the, the scroll and he read. And he sat down and he said, This day this Scripture is fulfilled. Let it happen again, Lord. Let it be again that this very day this very night that the Scripture that I read may be fulfilled. And we are all been teaching through the week that that was to be the very thing that was to prove the end time. And then our hearts will go away happy. There may be many here, Lord, that you're speaking to. Help us tonight to know your Word. Your Word vindicated to be the truth. Grant it, Father. And while we have our heads bound, just for a way of survey to quieten myself from preaching, how many of you in here that is not really a born-again Christian? Now, you may go to church, but that's not what I'm asking you're, if you're not a born-again Christian, but you believe there is a living Jesus, a real Holy Spirit, and you would like to be remembered to Him now, would you just, while every head's bowed now and eyes closed, just raise up your hand to Him. Lord, remember me. God bless you. God bless you. You, you. God bless you. God bless you. That's very fine. Where's our others? Now, we are not very many in number. But do you know, it's a world that looks for big things in large numbers. As we said last evening, it was only the little quiet voice that attracted the prophet to come forward with his face veiled. Now, you have faith in God. My brother and my sister have faith in God. And if our great, kind Lord Jesus will come for this word, lay sure His own word open, and will prove to you that the, this Holy Spirit that I speak of is the truth. You might have been confused many times with, with many things. But it only goes to show that there's real somewhere. And when he does that, I want you, that raised up your hands, to come see me just a moment. Now you may raise your heads. Lord Jesus, take this service into your hands now. I am your servant, and all the preaching, just one word from you will mean more than all we could say in a lifetime. Just one word. Grant it now, Father, as I commit this, those testimonies. You know they're true, Father. You was the one who gave them. And never have they failed. Grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many people in here that uh, does not have prayer cards that's sick? 
Raise up your hands. Everywhere in the building it does not have prayer cards and sick. All right? And those that have prayer cards, raise up your hand. It's be about the same. And they're all mixed up. Now, to look over the audience, first to be honest before God, before the, you. I know that I'm looking over here that some friends of mine sitting in this corner here, Brother Noel his, his, and Sister uh, Jones and um, Brother Outlaw. My son, his brother and your brother Moore. I don't know this brother, but I've seen him in the meetings the last few times. I can't make this brother name out either, but I know him just by face. Sister, right here, Sister Williams. Sister Sherrod sitting on the corner. Way back in the back is some people from the tabernacle at Jeffersonville. Sitting right here is a precious old friend of mine, 90 years old. That comes from Ohio. He drives across the country, and I'm leaving for Africa, and he and his lovely wife asked if they could go to Africa with me. That we are 90 years old. A German brother, never knew the Lord. When I preached one night, he come in with his good clothes on to be baptized. 90 years old. Outside of, I believe, oh, this is Brother um, Waldorf and Sister Waldorf sitting there. Now that's about as far as, I, and Brother Borders. Now, that's about it. Now, I'm calling their names. Now, if you who know me like that, don't pray. See, pray for me. But I want you who don't know me and know that I don't know you. I want you to say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I've heard this spoke of. I, I heard this minister tonight read this out of the Bible. I heard those testimony. And I've heard similar, you know, of different times this happened. Are we that close to the end, Lord? Are we that close? Remember, when that sign was done to Sodom, the city that burned, Jesus referred to it, said as it was, that was the last sign that they received before the city was destroyed. And Jesus said, that will be the repeat in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, you know that's right. How that the God, God in flesh... How many believe that was God talk to Abraham? Well, the Bible says Elohim, so that, that's the, uh, the great creator of heavens and earth, the all-sufficient one. He was. What was he showing? He was in a human body, stood there and eat the meat of a calf and drink the milk from the cow, and then could vanish out of sight. I will visit you according to the time that I promised you. <laughs> See? Called him by his name and with his back turned, he said, where's Sarah? Said, she's in the tent behind you. Said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah said, back in the tent. He said, why did Sarah laugh? You remember the Bible said she was in the tent behind him. Said, why did Sarah laugh? Sarah said it. Said, yes, you did. That's right. A man standing there, God representing himself in human flesh. Jesus said it would be the same thing at the coming of the Son of Man. God in His church. You, me, represented Himself. Now, there's a little woman when God was in Christ, He had the Spirit fully. He was God. I'm just one of His servants. And you're just one of His servants. We have the, the Spirit by, by measure. He had it without measure. In Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In me is just a little gift, and in you is a gift of it. But no matter how little it is, it's the same Spirit. Now, if that is the Spirit of God, it'll do the works of God. Now, you pray and say, Lord Jesus, a little woman one time touched his garment. And we say over here in the New Testament, he said, in Hebrews, he said, He is a high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How many knows that's the Bible? Say, Amen. Amen. Sure. Well, that's got to be true. Well, if he's the same yesterday and forever, how would he answer you? Same as he did yesterday, if he's the same today. Now, you pray and say, Lord Jesus, let me touch your garment. And then you give Brother Branham a little gift to encourage us. And you don't know me. 
I'm sitting way back here and over here and down here and wherever. I'm saying, He don't know me, but you know me. And let me see your great spirit, Lord, not as I have to do it, but just to help encourage me and the rest of them because we have read the Word. Let me touch your garment and you speak right back. Let me be used tonight, Lord, for that purpose. And it'll show the whole audience that you're still alive. That'd be wonderful if you'd do that. Now, you just kind of pray to yourself quietly. Say, Lord, let me touch your garment. And I'll yield myself to the Spirit. And then may the Holy Ghost do the rest. Because now I've talked, testified, but I can't do no more now. I'm at the end of my road. Just watch the audience to see if I... I have to see it, you know. You understand that. Back to my left. Way back, about middle ways back of the building, is a woman praying... She's fixing to die if God doesn't help her. She has cancer. And the cancer is on her breast. Oh, may she not miss it. Help me, O Lord. Sister, if you will believe. (laughs) She's going to miss it. Lord Jesus. Help us, we pray. Mary, May. There you are. Are we strangers to one another? I don't know you. You don't know me. Was that the conditions and what? If everything was said was true, then believe. It'll be over. Amen. Now, from the darkness that was over, it's light. Just as sure as that boy, the epilepsy stayed away from him. The same God, the one who's up there in the north woods, is the same God here. Just keep believing. (laughs) Amen. If thou canst believe. Here it is over a woman sitting here in front of me. She's got something wrong in her back. It's a disc out in her back. She, uh, she isn't from here. She's from Montana. Her name is Miss Stubbs. Stand up. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have to press. Relax. A big fellow sitting here looking at me. Doing like that. Believe. You get well. <laughs> Got nervous trouble. If you believe it, God will make you well. The lady of female trouble. Leave it and you can get well. Go back home. And have faith in God. Why do I say go back home? You'd have to go back to New Mexico to get there. Mr. and Mrs. Watkins. Now you know I don't know you. Amen. A lady right behind you at that ulcer on the leg, Miss Brown. Will you believe it? God will heal you. You look so interested. Now, you know I've never seen you in my life. <laughs> on the left leg. Now, you believe with all your heart, you'll get well. Praise God. Praise God. 
lady trying to move, and she has arthritis that's binding her bad. Mrs. Fairhead, you believe with all your heart, you'll get well. Now, you know I've never seen you in my life. I, oh, Amen. You believe with all your heart now? Now, what will he do? He will take the things that I have told you and will show them to you. And then he will show you things that is to come. You see what I mean? You believe him? Now, let's bow our heads again. Now, you that know that if you would pass away from this life tonight, that should be, wouldn't be, you'd be gone. You're not born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom. Why don't you come right here? Stand here and let us pray for you right here just a minute. Will you come right now in the presence of this Spirit? You'll never see anything happen greater until you see the coming of the Lord. I just remember. Surely, I know what I'm speaking of, or He wouldn't grant the ministry. Don't let it pass you now. Are you sincere? Would you come? If not, then between you and God, it lays. I am innocent. I'm clean of all blood because I have told you the truth. I've preached you the word. I've told you what he was. And he, when he come, he proved what he was then. And he lets me prove what he is now. He's the same as he was then. You believe it? Then how many sick is in here then? Other is here sick. Raise up your hands. Now, put your hands over on one another and let's pray the prayer of faith for you. Now, I want to ask you something quietly. If God, if God can come and do that miracle, a miracle is something that cannot be explained. Now, if you wish to question any of these people around, go question them. Any time of anywhere. See, just remember, it is God. This year is just amateur visions. Who, who, what's doing that? It's you, yourself. You're the ones doing that. You see, when that woman touched his garment, he said, virtue went out of me. But when the father showed him about Lazarus and he went away and come back and raised up Lazarus from the dead, he never said virtue. That was God using his own gift. And the other was a woman using God's gift. I am not God's gift. Jesus Christ is God's gift. It's just a gift that He gave me that I was born that way with the subconscious and the conscious, first conscious right together. You don't go to sleep. You just see it. The Holy Spirit comes up on this subconscious just like it does on the first conscious. If it come on your subconscious, you'd have a spiritual dream. If it comes up on mine, I don't dream. I just look there and see it. See? And we're born. You can't make yourself anything different. You're born that way. See? Gifts and callings are without repentance. What is it to do? To manifest Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. With your hands laid on one another. I trust that you will put your heart in God's care right now. Lord, search me. Have I become so numb by the things of the world that I'm failing to see this great hour that's passing by? You know, that's what it's always been. It went right through the church and they never noted. That's history. Don't let it pass, friends. To see a word proven over and over, see the word of God manifested, and the very person of Jesus Christ come right in among this people and do exactly the way he did before. Heavenly Father, I feel now, Lord, that your word was read, the testimony was given. The Holy Spirit came down and vindicated that word and the testimony. Now it's in the hands of the people, Lord. It lays in their lap. There's nothing else that I know to say. And I don't know of anything else you wrote in the word that you would do because you've already healed them. It's just to make them to believe it. And you doing a thing like this. And how could we doubt any longer? How could we permit Satan to numb our conscience any longer? Satan, I pronounce this healing upon these people. And say to you, I jure thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Get out of here. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ and let this people go. Now, if you believe him, stand on your feet. You believe. Raise up to your feet then and give God praise. Raise up and believe it. Don't doubt it no more. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the Holy Spirit bring joy, power, resurrection, life to this people, Lord. Give Him praise now and bless His holy name. We love Him. We praise Him. We adore Him. The matchless one, the eternal one, the Son of the living God. And in His name, receive Him. He's here. Amen.